Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear reports from Anna Mateo and John Russell. Jill Robbins and Greg Stockel answer a question from an English learner named Miguel. We close our program with an American story. This week it is the cask of Amontillado. But first, here is Anna Mateo. Many food snacks, popular today in the United States, were not invented by a cook at a famous restaurant, but rather by food scientists in the U.S. military. From instant coffee and Cheetos to packaged cookies and energy bars, those military scientists were tasked to make food for soldiers that could be easily carried, stored, and eaten. The invention of these foods sped up during World War II. At the time, military scientists needed to develop small but nutritious food for troops. Anastasia Marx de Salcedo told VOA News that there was a great need for the military to develop modern rations. To do this, the food writer explains, the military had to find many new food processing techniques. It also created a food science research system that exists to this day. In her book, Combat Ready Kitchen, How the U.S. Military Shapes the Way You Eat, Marx de Salcedo explains that history. The new techniques include high-pressure processing. This process ensures that uncooked food is safe to eat. It is commonly used in packaged foods like guacamole, salsa, and hummus. Cheetos, one of America's favorite cheesy snacks, is another example. They are made using a dehydration process. The military food scientists found a way to remove the water from cheese. This kept cheese from going bad and made it lighter to transport to troops overseas. The scientists behind military food production looked to the way army doctors treat soldiers on the battlefield. They use freeze dehydration to carry fresh blood products. The scientists used the same process. After the war ended, says Marx de Salcedo, there was a little freeze dehydration industry, but they no longer had a purpose. So, she explains, the military began developing food products with freeze dehydration. This, she adds, gave us freeze-dried coffee, tea, and soups. NASA used this process to make freeze-dried foods for its astronauts. However, the astronauts did not like the taste of the freeze-dried products, which were really early versions of the modern energy bar. So the military found ways to make the food taste better. Military scientists also discovered that pet food companies were using dehydration to lower water content, but still keeping the food from getting completely dry. Once they figured that out, says Marx de Salcedo, they were able to keep foods moist at room temperature and with regular packaging. She adds that this technique is also used with baked goods. The moist cookies we buy in the store today 
are the result of this military research. The military also copied a chocolate snack wrapped in hard candy that U.S. troops had found in Europe. The soldiers could carry the candy in their pockets, and the chocolate would not melt. And that is how the very popular M&M candies were born. Today, some of the biggest military researchers continue to search for a chocolate that does not melt under extreme heat. I'm Ana Mateo. American theaters are changing during the coronavirus crisis. Theater groups are finding new, creative ways to perform their art, but it is unclear if such performances should be called live theater or another term. Theater experts say, "Broadway is still alive." There continues to be theater on New York's famous Broadway, but it is beyond Manhattan's closed theaters. Up north lies the United Palace, a theater with seats for three thousand people. An actor recently read lines from a stage. The silent theater was mostly empty. Tony Award winner Jefferson Mays was performing several parts from *A Christmas Carol*, based on the book by Charles Dickens. The performance was being filmed for streaming this month. This one-man show is an example of how many who work in theater are refusing to let COVID-19 stop their art. Tony Award-winning producer Hunter Arnold was watching Mays on stage. Because it's such a roll-up-your-sleeves business, theater people figure it out. Arnold said, "Roll up your sleeves is an expression that means to prepare to work very hard." Of everything I've ever done in my life, Arnold added. It's the place where people lead from how instead of leading from why not. The coronavirus crisis shut down theaters and the TV and movie industries last spring. Film and TV production have slowly started again, but the virus has created an especially difficult problem for theaters. That problem. Is the reason it will be among the last performing arts to return to normal. In theaters, props and costumes are usually touched by many people each night. An orchestra, a large musical group, is often put in a small area just beneath the stage. Backstage areas are small and shared. And theaters are often very crowded. New ways are needed. Theaters are trying many different ideas. They have done radio plays, online readings, online variety shows, and drive-in experiences that mix live singing with movies. The performers of the musical Diana met on Broadway to film the show. For the American streaming company Netflix, Mays' *A Christmas Carol* was filmed on a set with a high-tech light source. The performance is raising money for suffering small theaters around the country. The San Francisco Playhouse recently offered showings of Yasmina Reza's play *Art*, a production captured live by many cameras. An important scene that required the actors to touch each other was reimagined to keep social distancing. A musical version of the animated film *Ratatouille* is being explored on TikTok.
Charlotte Moore is the artistic director and co-founder of the Irish Repertory Theatre in New York City. We will conquer it. We are theatre people. By God, we will conquer it and get it done, she said. Her company has put on a free streaming holiday production of Meet Me in St. Louis. Moore directed the production from St. Louis. It has around twelve performers who are recorded individually. The performers were mailed or given props, costumes, and a green screen. A green screen permits a person to perform without a background. On a computer, the green is later removed and the background is placed behind the performer. The performers rehearsed on Zoom and FaceTime, two apps that let people see and talk to each other. A masked and socially distant orchestra recorded the music, and the sets were projected onto the actors' screens. You learn minute by minute by minute along the way what works, what doesn't, what to do, what not to do, said Moore. She performed in the first Broadway production of Meet Me in St. Louis in 1989. I'm John Russell. Today we answer a question from our reader, Miguel. He writes... Why is it wrong to answer a question like this? Yes, I'm, or yes, it's, or yes, he's. Thank you, from Miguel. Dear Miguel, thank you for your question. Your examples use short answers that include what grammar experts call weak forms. When a speaker uses a contraction or shortened word, the sound of the vowel almost disappears. An example is the word I'm. In this contraction, the a ah sound in am is harder to hear. This happens because the speaker uses less force to say the vowel sound. There are two rules that apply to these forms. These rules help explain why you cannot answer, yes, I'm. The first rule has to do with an answer that leaves out part of a thought. Here is an example. Is that your dog? Yes, it is. After it is, we understand that the words needed to make a complete thought are my dog. The speaker does not need to say my dog because the listener understands what they are talking about. But the speaker cannot reduce this answer to, yes, it's. So the rule is that when something is left out at the end of a statement, you cannot end the statement with a weak form. But this is not true when the short answer is no. In that case, the negative word not follows directly after the verb. So the weak form is not at the end of the statement. Here is an example. Are you ready? No, I'm not. There's still something missing at the end of the statement, the word ready. But the statement does not end with the weak form, I'm. The second rule has to do with stress. The loudness or force a speaker uses on different sounds in a sentence. Listen to the stress pattern here. Will we all go? I think we will. The speaker says the words go and will with more force or stress. If a word is stressed, English does not permit reduced or weak forms. So, you cannot say, I think we'll. However, 
a speaker can stress the negative form. I think we won't. I hope this helps you understand, Miguel. Thank you for the question. And that's Ask a Teacher. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Greg Stockel. Our story today is called The Cask of Amontillado. It was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Here is Larry West with the story. Fortunato and I both were members of very old and important Italian families. We used to play together when we were children. Fortunato was bigger, richer, and more handsome than I was. And he enjoyed making me look like a fool. He hurt my feelings a thousand times during the years of my childhood. I never showed my anger, however, so he thought we were good friends. But I promised myself that one day I would punish Fortunato for his insults to me. Many years passed. Fortunato married a rich and beautiful woman who gave him sons. Deep in my heart, I hated him. But I never said or did anything that showed him how I really felt. When I smiled at him, he thought it was because we were friends. He did not know it was the thought of his death that made me smile. Everyone in our town respected Fortunato. Some men were afraid of him because he was so rich and powerful. He had a weak spot, however. He thought, he was an excellent judge of wine. I also was an expert on wine. I spent a lot of money buying rare and costly wines. I stored the wines in the dark rooms under my family's palace. Our palace was one of the oldest buildings in the town. The Montresor family had lived in it for hundreds of years. We had buried our dead in the rooms under the palace. These tombs were quiet, dark places that no one but myself ever visited. Late one evening, during carnival season, I happened to meet Fortunato on the street. He was going home alone from a party. Fortunato was beautiful in his silk suit made of many colors, yellow, green, purple, and red. On his head he wore an orange cap covered with little silver bells. I could see he had been drinking too much wine. He threw his arms around me. He said he was glad to see me. I said I was glad to see him, too, because I had a little problem. What is it? he asked, putting his large hand on my shoulder. My dear Fortunato, I said, I'm afraid I have been very stupid. The man who sells me wine said he had a rare barrel of Amontillado wine. I believed him, and I bought it from him. But now I'm not so sure that the wine is really Amontillado. What, he said, a cask of Amontillado at this time of year? An entire barrel? Impossible. Yes, I was very stupid. I paid the wine man the full price he wanted. 
without asking you to taste the wine first. But I couldn't find you, and I was afraid he would sell the cask of Amontillado to someone else. So I bought it. A cask of Amontillado, Fortunato repeated. Where is it? I pretended I didn't hear his question. Instead, I told him I was going to visit our friend Lucreci. He will be able to tell me if the wine is really Amontillado, I said. Fortunato laughed in my face. Lucreci cannot tell Amontillado from vinegar. I smiled to myself and said, But some people say that he is as good a judge of wine as you are. Fortunato grabbed my arm. Take me to it, he said. I'll taste the Amontillado for you. But, my friend, I protested, it is late. The wine is in my wine cellar underneath the palace. Those rooms are very damp and cold, and the walls drip with water. I don't care, he said. I am the only person who can tell you if your wine man has cheated you. Lucreci cannot. Fortunato turned, and still holding me by the arm, pulled me down the street to my home. The building was empty. My servants were enjoying carnival. I knew they would be gone all night. I took two large candles, lit them, and gave one to Fortunato. I started down the dark, twisting stairway with Fortunato close behind me. At the bottom of the stairs, the damp air wrapped itself around our bodies. Where are we? Fortunato asked. I thought you said the cask of Amontillado was in your wine cellar. It is, I said. The wine cellar is just beyond these tombs where the dead of my family are kept. Surely you are not afraid of walking through the tombs. He turned and looked into my eyes. Tombs, he said. He began to cough. The silver bells on his cap jingled. My poor friend, I said, how long have you had that cough? It's nothing, he said. But he couldn't stop coughing. Come, I said firmly. We will go back upstairs. Your health is important. You are rich, respected, admired, and loved. You have a wife and children. Many people would miss you if you died. We will go back before you get seriously ill. I can go to Lucreci for help with the wine. No, he cried. This <coughs> cough is nothing. It will not kill me. I won't die <coughs> from a cough. Uh, that is true, I said. But you must be careful. He took my arm, and we began to walk through the cold, dark rooms. We went deeper and deeper into the cellar. Finally, we arrived in a small room. Bones were pushed high against one wall. A doorway in another wall open to an even smaller room, about one meter wide and two meters high. Its walls were solid rock. Here we are, I said. I hid the cask of Amontillado in there. I pointed to the smaller room. Fortunato lifted his candle and stepped into the tiny room. I immediately followed him. He stood stupidly staring at two iron handcuffs chained to a wall of the tiny room. I grabbed his arms and locked them into the metal handcuffs. It took only a moment. He was too surprised to fight me. I stepped outside the small room. Where is the Amadiado? he cried. Ah, yes, I said. 
the cask of Amontillado. I leaned over and began pushing aside the pile of bones against the wall. Under the bones was a basket of stone blocks, some cement, and a small shovel. I had hidden the materials there earlier. I began to fill the doorway of the tiny room with stones and cement. By the time I laid the first row of stones, Fortunato was no longer drunk. I heard him moaning inside the tiny room for ten minutes. Then there was a long silence. I finished the second and third rows of stone blocks. As I began the fourth row, I heard Fortunato begin to shake the chains that held him to the wall. He was trying to pull them out of the granite wall. I smiled to myself and stopped working so that I could better enjoy listening to the noise. After a few minutes, he stopped. I finished the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh rows of stones. The wall I was building in the doorway was now almost up to my shoulders. Suddenly loud screams burst from the throat of the chained man. For a moment, I worried. What if someone heard him? Then I placed my hand on the solid rock of the walls and felt safe. I looked into the tiny room where he was still screaming, and I began to scream too. My screams grew louder than his, and he stopped. It was now almost midnight. I finished the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth rows. All that was left was a stone for the last hole in the wall. I was about to push it in when I heard a low laugh from behind the stones. The laugh made the hair on my head stand up. Then Fortunato spoke in a sad voice that no longer sounded like him. He said, Well, you have played a good joke on me. We will laugh about it soon over a glass of that Amontillado. But isn't it getting late? My wife and my friends will be waiting for us. Let us go. Yes, I replied. Let us go. I waited for him to say something else. I heard only my own breathing. Fortunato, I called. No answer. I called again. Fortunato. Still no answer. I hurried to put the last stone into the wall and put the cement around it. Then I pushed the pile of bones in front of the new wall I had built. That was fifty years ago. For half a century now, no one has touched those bones. May he rest in peace. You have just heard the story... The Cask of Amontillado. It was written by Edgar Allan Poe and adapted for special English by Donna DeSantis. Your storyteller was Larry West.